What's up guys, Tommy Bowie here from Move Rewind and welcome to our annual 2024 summer special and this year I wanted to do something Spider-Man related because Spider-Man and especially Spider-Man films have been such an important part of my life and I just felt I've never actually done a video where I have ranked them before. So today I thought I would change that by doing a tier ranking of the Spider-Man films. Now before we get into this ranking I just want to give a few quick disclaimers Disclaimers. Firstly, this is my opinion. I am very biased, just like anyone else, so please bear that in mind. Secondly, S tier is a Spider Man film where I find there are hardly any flaws, and F tier is a Spider Man film that I wouldn't even recommend my worst enemy watch. And I am ranking these Spider Man films based on, firstly, enjoyment, how much I enjoy watching these films. Secondly, how much I think they uh, reflect the character of Spider-Man. And thirdly, the performances of not only the actor who's portraying Spider-Man, but the actors who are portraying his love interests, as well as the actors who are portraying his villains. Because Spider-Man has one of the most impressive rogues gallery in all of uh, comic book history. And it's important when I'm watching a Spider-Man film that the villain is done justice. Now, with all that out of the way... Let's get on with this ranking. So the first film is obviously Spider-Man, released in 2002, starring Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man slash Peter Parker, directed by Sam Raimi. And Spider-Man, it's such a fantastic film. It's probably my favourite film. Um, I just think it's it just sums up Spider-Man perfectly. It's fun. The pacing of this film is excellent. Every single scene in this film feels relevant to the story. And what is this story? Well, mostly it's a love story between Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson. And I really enjoy their romance. I think it's a great will they, won't they? And by the end of the film, when Peter decides to put his responsibilities first, you do feel devastated. I wanted to see them two get together and I still tear up to this day at the conclusion of this film. But this film gets everything right from the scene in which Peter's bitten by a spider to the wrestling scenes to Uncle Ben's murder. Every iconic Spider-Man uh, scene is done justice in this film. And obviously Willem Dafoe as the Green Goblin, one of the most iconic comic book film adaptations ever. I cannot think of anyone other than Defoe portraying this role. So for me, Spider-Man goes in A tier because this is just a Sam Raimi film true and tr through and through. And you can tell that Raimi adores the character of Spider-Man and was determined to do it justice. And it definitely paid off. Next, we have Spider-Man 2. Now, Spider-Man 2 does exactly what the first film did but better. There's a real emotional core to Spider-Man 2. I love Peter Parker's story arc throughout the film in that he is beginning to lose faith, he's beginning to lose his powers because he's so messed up with his feelings for Mary Jane Watson and he's determined to try and put his responsibilities first and that scene in which he has that dream with Uncle Ben where he decides you know he just wants to be Peter Parker, he's Spider-Man no more and he throws his suit in the bin that is a heartbreaking scene and surely one of the most memorable scenes to come out of any Spider-Man film. Alfred Molina as Doc Ock, he is fantastic. Once again, much like Willem Dafoe as the Green Goblin, I can't imagine another actor portraying this character. And Doc Ock is slightly different to the Green Goblin in the sense that you actually feel really, really sorry for him. He's a very tragic villain and I think it's great that he had that redemption at the end when he helped... Spider-Man saved the city by sacrificing himself. Spider-Man 2 has some of the best action scenes. That train scene between Spider-Man and Doc Ock is perfection, as well as Doc Ock's um, attack on the hospital, which just kind of shows Sam Raimi was once a horror film director. Spider-Man 2, it, it's the perfect superhero film. I think I always remember reading a YouTube comment, which has really stuck with me, and it just says, this isn't just a good comic book film. This is a good film. And I think that that is... That, that sums it up. This is not only one of the best comic book films ever released. It's also, in my personal opinion, one of the best films ever released. And the ending where Peter and Mary Jane finally get together. What a perfect ending. So I'm going to put Spider-Man 2 in the S tier. It is the gold standard when it comes to comic book films. Next we have Spider-Man 3. Now if you asked me... 
a few years ago what I thought of Spider-Man 3. I'd honestly probably put it in D tier or E tier. I really didn't like this film. But having rewatched it in um, in recent months, I can appreciate it a lot. Sam Raimi is a great director and this definitely feels like a follow-up to Spider-Man 2. Now, obviously, there was a lot of studio interference. Raimi didn't want to have Venom in this film, but Aviarad insisted that Venom needed to be in this film. But I don't actually think that the symbiote storyline is done that badly. I mean, if I think even the dancing, yes, it's goofy, but for some reason, it fits Sam Raimi's Spider-Man films. So I actually... I have a very big soft spot for Spider-Man 3. I think the performances of Tobey Maguire, Kirsten Dunst and James Franco are all very good. I think Thomas Hayden Church was perfect as Sandman. I wish they had done a bit more with him to be fair. But for the most part I think that he was a decent villain and he had a very tragic backstory. Venom, Venom is the letdown of this film. As much as I like the black Spider-Man symbiote suit... I think Topher Grace, he was just miscast as Venom. I don't think that he was right for that role. And even though the design of Venom is not that bad, I feel like he's just shoehorned in at the end and it just feels very tacked on. Saying that though, I really do enjoy the final battle where Spider-Man and Harry have to fight Venom and Sandman. It feels like an Avengers team up before the Avengers were ever a thing. And I really enjoy it. So I enjoy Spider-Man 3. I think it is a fitting end to the Spider-Man trilogy. And um, as much as I would love to see Spider-Man 4. Because I think there is such great potential. I think Spider-Man 3 was a decent conclusion. So I'm going to put Spider-Man 3 in the C tier. Because it's not perfect. But I think there are a lot of positives. Which people don't give it credit for. Next we have the amazing Spider-Man. Now... I have an even bigger soft spot for The Amazing Spider-Man. It is the first Spider-Man film I saw in cinemas. I remember seeing this well in 2012. Um, it was marketed as the untold story. Did it tell us anything we didn't already know? Not really. It follows the same formula. I mean, this was at a time when, you know, the Dark Knight trilogy had been released. Comic book films were trying to get a bit darker, a bit edgy. And The Amazing Spider-Man definitely falls into that. It's a lot more realistic than the Raimi trilogy it's a bit more dark it's a bit more gritty but actually I don't mind that this film definitely sticks out um, as a very different kind of Spider-Man film plus I love the lizard um, Risa fans he, he's great as lizard I do wish that there was more screen time of him but from what we saw I I just love the lizard I have a real soft spot he's my favorite Spider-Man villain so obviously I'm gonna love this film I think Andrew Garfield he's perfect as Peter Parker he really is um, and he captures the more jokey side of Spider-Man very well Emma Stone as Gwen Stacy she's my favorite love interest in any Spider-Man film. Um, not only is Emma Stone an amazing actor, but I just think there's so much chemistry between Garfield and Stone on screen that they really do bring that relationship between Peter Parker and Gwen Stacy to life. For the most part, I enjoy The Amazing Spider-Man. It is a very different kind of Spider-Man film. I think it's one of those films where you can tell the director was putting a lot of effort into it to try and make it different. And considering this was only released five years after Spider-Man 3, it had a massive task of trying to introduce audiences who are already familiar with the Spider-Man trilogy to a uh, to see Spider-Man through a new lens and I think they did a decent job with it so I'm going to put the amazing Spider-Man you know what? I'm going to put it in the B tier because I once again a lot like Spider-Man 3 I don't think it's as bad as people think now a few years ago I probably would have said it would be in D tier but I think it's a good Spider-Man film I think it definitely stands out compared to some of the others Right, next we have The Amazing Spider-Man 2. It goes in F. Um, I was angry when I first saw this film when I was 14. And I'm still angry about it now. This is a great example of a film that was hurt by studio interference. Forget the darker tone of The Amazing Spider-Man. Actually, forget any potential that The Amazing Spider-Man had. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 ruins it. And there is so much potential in this film. You've got Jamie Foxx as Electro. Jamie Foxx, great actor. Could have given us a great Electro. 
But in this film, he doesn't do a lot. He's obsessed with Spider-Man and then he becomes Electro. And even though they have a great action scene in Times Square, he's then kind of forgotten about until the ending. And then he's in some kind of Lycra suit for some reason, which I, I still don't understand where he got that Lycra suit from. It just kind of materialises out of anywhere. So um, anyway, I don't like The Amazing Spider-Man 2. <laughs> Dan DeHaan's portrayal of the Green Goblin is laughably bad. I think it's one of the worst villain performances in any Spider-Man film. And the Green Goblin is only around for about 10 minutes with a fight with Spider-Man at the end. Oh yeah, and Rhino. Rhino's in this for about 5 minutes. Um, I don't know why. You know, he was on all the posters. He was heavy in the marketing. But yeah, Rhino only really appears in the final scene of the film. So that's just wasted potential. There is way too much going on in this film. There are so many scenes of just people standing around and talking. And when you look at the behind the scenes and how much of this film was cut, even Mary Jane Watson was supposed to appear in this film. So that's how much stuff was cut from this film. It is atrocious. The only, the only silver lining are Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone. Once again, they have great chemistry. And Gwen's death was done very well. But despite those two impressive things, I cannot put it any higher than an F tier. Because for me, it was one of Spider-Man's lowest points in terms of cinema. And it's one which I never really watch. Even when I do marathons of every Spider-Man film, I try and avoid it because I just can't stand this film. Right, next we have Spider-Man Homecoming. Now, obviously, this was highly anticipated because Spider-Man was joining the MCU and we saw him in Civil War, so now he had his first solo film in the MCU. And it's a decent MCU film. <laughs> and what I mean by that is it, it does follow the Marvel formula. You know, um, it's not really taking any chances. It's safe. You can tell Marvel are playing it safe with this film. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. You know, after The Amazing Spider-Man 2 had so much going on in it and trying to set up different franchises and spin-off films, Spider-Man Homecoming is just simple. It's just a simple story, and I think it works. It's just Peter Parker in high school, and uh, he's just trying to get a girl to like him. And that's not a bad thing, you know? Michael Keaton as Vulture, he's iconic. I really like Vulture in this film. I love the plot twist of the Vulture being Liz's dad. Um, I did not see that coming. So when that door opens and we see him, that's, I still remember the theatre I was seeing it in. Every member of the audience was like, <gasps> and that was just a great moment. I like the action scenes in this film. I think they're done very well. I like how Iron Man is in this film, but he doesn't overshadow it. He's kind of Spider-Man's mentor in a way and he only pops up now and again so I don't think he necessarily takes away from Spider-Man's growth throughout this film and I also think it's an interesting take on with great power comes great responsibility the idea that Spider-Man has this you know very technical suit and all these upgrades and abilities and by the end of the film he's actually just stripped back to just his old suit and just his powers and his mind. And he has to try and sort things out without any help. And I just thought that was an interesting twist on the with great power comes great responsibility. So I really enjoy Spider-Man Homecoming. It is playing it safe. It's not taking any risks. But I am going to put it in the B tier. Because it's an enjoyable Spider-Man film. Which I think, you know, especially around summer, it's a great film to watch. It really does just brighten up your day. Next we have Venom. The first spin-off film in Sony's Spider-Man cinematic universe or whatever and um, I remember when Venom came out and a lot of people seemed to like it I was not one of them I have to admit I really do struggle with Venom I don't think it's a great film to be honest um, I'm gonna put it in the E tier Tom Hardy is good as Venom he's a lot better than Topher Grace that's for sure but for the most part, I, I just find Venom boring. I, I struggle to stay engaged with it. And after I finished watching it, I usually forget what happened in it. Now, I know some people like this film. But for me, I just I never got on with it. I just I, I think they could have done so much more with a Venom solo film. But considering Spider-Man's not in it, then I just 
I don't think it works very well. So yeah, Venom, it's all right. It's serviceable, I suppose. And as I said, Tom Hardy's a good actor and he does well as Eddie Brock and Venom. But yeah, it's it's, it's just it's one of those films I just can't seem to connect with at all. Now, we have Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Now, I remember I had no clue that this film was coming out. Um, and my mate was like, oh, can we go and see it? So I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll go and see it. Um, why not? I was blown away. It is a fantastic film. The animation in this film alone makes it at least an A tier. Miles Morales, I didn't know a lot about him going in to see this film. But I do now. And he was great. It's such a very different kind of Spider-Man film. And I'm glad it's animation. You know, animated films... A lot of people seem to think animated films should only be for kids. But Into the Spider-Verse proves that that's not the case. I love Kingpin. He's a great villain in this film. As are Doc Ock, Scorpion, Hammerhead, Tombstone. Basically, all of the villains in this film are perfect. And I love the different um, incarnations of Spider-Man. You know, Spider-Man Noir... Peter B. Parker, Spider-Gwen, they're all fantastic. I just think Into the Spider-Verse, it's an amazing film. They did such a good job giving us something different, something which really will stay in your mind for a very long time. This is one of those films which I think is going to be looked back on in about 20 years' time as an all-time classic. So I'm going to put Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I'm going to put it in the A tier. Now, I know some people won't be happy with that, but trust me, there's a reason I've put it in A tier rather than S tier. Spider-Man Far From Home. I'm not a massive fan of this film. And I think that's because it's kind of the follow-up to Avengers Endgame. And I think that hurts it as a Spider-Man film. There's so much Iron Man-related stuff in this film. That I just think it takes away from the character of Spider-Man. The character of Spider-Man is already a fantastic character. We don't need to spend so much time focusing on Iron Man. Spider-Man really does seem to become Iron Man Jr. in this film. And I'm not a massive fan of it. Now once again the plot it's pretty simple. It's a road trip film. You know they go to different locations and Spider-Man's trying to chat up MJ. And actually, I really like Peter and MJ, Tom Holland and Zendaya. Once again, they have fantastic chemistry, um, and I really enjoy them together. Um, especially love how MJ is very sarcastic to Peter, and he has to try and figure out, oh, does she actually like me or not? I find that really interesting. And I also think Jake Gyllenhaal is great as Mysterio, and I'm not ashamed to admit that plot twist of Mysterio not being from a parallel dimension and it all being a setup and fake is fantastic and I should have seen that coming because obviously I know what Mysterio is about he's all about illusions but I didn't see it coming at all so I thought that was a great plot twist and the fight between Spider-Man and Mysterio where we see Spider-Man in Mysterio's dome head that was fantastic that was like straight out of the comics but I just can't escape the fact that this film just feels like Endgame's follow-up I think just being released directly after Avengers Endgame really hurt this film as a Spider-Man film. So I'm going to put it in the D tier because I just felt like it didn't really progress Peter's story. It feels like he's the exact same in this film as he was at the end of Homecoming. And that's just not what I want to see. I want to see a bit of character growth as the films go on. <laughs> Morbius. Do I have to say anything? It's Morbin time. F tier. Um... I hadn't seen this film until about a month ago. I saw it with my mate and I was appalled. I nearly turned it off. Jared Leto is horrendous in this film. Nearly as bad as the film's script. This is a terrible film. I have no idea what they were thinking of. And Morbius is an interesting Spider-Man villain. I would highly recommend watching uh, the 90s Spider-Man season 2 where, where Michael Morbius plays quite a pivotal role. He's actually a really interesting villain and there's a lot of sympathy you could do there. But in this film, it is a joke. The only actor I like in this film is Matt Smith because it's like Matt Smith knows it's shit but he's just going to have fun. Whereas everyone else seems to be trying to take it really seriously. So Morbius... One of the worst films I've ever seen. So, no way is that film getting any more than an F tier. It's one of the worst films I've ever seen. 
Venom Let's There Be Carnage. F tier. I hate this film. I know some people like it. I hate it. I'm a massive Carnage fan. Woody Harrison is terrible as Carnage. This is a shit film. It was such a... It was such hard work getting through this film. It was that bad. I don't think they progressed Venom's character arc at all. I honestly can't remember what his character arc was. I know that him and the symbiote separate at one point and then they go back together. It's, it's really confusing and I'm not that interested. The fight scenes between Venom and Carnage are terrible. And Carnage, you know, he's supposed to be this psychopath, this individual who just kills people for the sake of it. For some reason, they introduce a love interest for him and then he kind of just becomes this guy who wants to impress his girl. And it's like, no, that is not Carnage. Carnage is supposed to be a psychopath. I want to see him just massacring people for the hell of it. This is a terrible film. It does a massive disservice to Carnage. And yeah, it, it, once again, much like Morbius, it's one of the worst comic book films I've ever seen. Spider-Man No Way Home. The Spider-Man film which had the most mystery around it because no one really knew what it was going to be about. And it's it's a, it's a great Spider-Man film. Um, I know some people have said, you know, since it was released, oh, now the hype's died down, it's not actually that good. But I think they're wrong. This is what I wanted to see from the MCU Spider-Man. This is 100% Peter's story. We see his growth throughout this film. This is Peter Parker becoming the friendly neighbourhood Spider-Man. We get Aunt May's death. We get the great power with great responsibility scene, which I thought was so well done. And that scene after May has died, when Peter is just sitting there in the rain, that is such a powerful scene. It's one of those scenes where no words are required. There's no dialogue because you know 100% what the characters are thinking. Zendaya, she's once again great in this film. I love her chemistry with Peter and it was heartbreaking at the end of this film when MJ forgot who Peter was. The returning villains, that was a stroke of genius, I have to admit. Alfred Molina, Willem Dafoe, they've still got it, you know. And Jamie Foxx, it just shows how great he could have been in The Amazing Spider-Man 2 as Electro. He's probably the villain I enjoyed seeing the most in this film for the simple reason we got to see how great he could be in that role. And um, Willem Dafoe as the Green Goblin, I've already mentioned this, but what an iconic villain. You needed a villain like that to go up against Tom Holland's Spider-Man. Spider-Man needed that villain to kind of push him to the edge. And I thought it was done so well. And plus, obviously, Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire returning to the roles of Spider-Man in this film. I saw this film three times in cinema. Every single time when they appear, the crowd goes absolutely wild. And... I like how they could have literally just been shoehorned in. You know, they could have just had a quick cameo and that was it. But no, they actually use them well in this film. They help Tom Holland's Spider-Man move on and progress. And I just thought it was done very well. This is a film which could have just been nostalgia bait. You know, they could have just thrown all of these things in, all these cameos and references to previous Spider-Man films. And, you know, it could have felt really cheap and just very easy to make but no they actually put together a compelling story they made a live action spider-verse film would i want to see one again i don't think so because i think this film was just great i think it did everything i wanted to see from a live action spider-man film so i'm going to put it in the a tier because it is definitely tom holland's best spider-man film i do hope he does a fourth film because i think there is still a lot of potential for that incarnation of spider-man but I was very pleased with how his trilogy ended. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Now, this is one of the best films I have ever seen. I didn't think that they could make a film better than Into the Spider-Verse. But they proved me wrong. The animation, it picks up a gear in this film. It's breathtaking you know, to just to think how much talent and creativity was involved in the making of this film. Spider-Gwen is now my favourite incarnation of Spider-Man. Um, she really is. I thought she was amazing in this film. I love her character arc. Um, Miles Morales, he's once again great. And I love how he is this anomaly. 
he's not supposed to be Spider-Man and that's what all of this is about these events which the canon events which every Spider-Man has to go through I think that's a really interesting idea we get the return of the spectacular Spider-Man yeah it's only for about a 10 second scene but I have to admit it's fantastic to see him return there are so many easter eggs and references in this film which is just what you want to see but a lot like No Way Home it doesn't feel nostalgia for nostalgia's sake it actually progresses the story this is this is just a great film you know it's such a great film it just shows what you can do with animated films it really does you have the freedom to do whatever you want and they did a great job and i can't wait to see beyond the spider-verse because i think that's going to be great as well so i'm going to put across the spider-verse in the s tier because i just think it's a film which once again it's not just a great spider-man film it's a great film in general and next we have Madam Web. Now I'm sure some of you will think I'm going to put Madam Web in F tier. But, and I can't believe I'm going to say this. I enjoyed Madam Web somehow. I don't know why that is. I don't know if that's because my expectations were so low. But I didn't think it was that bad. I thought Dakota Johnson was actually pretty good. I thought Sidney Sweeney was actually pretty good as well. And I was having fun while watching it. Now I know. It is a terrible film. But for me, it's one of those films, it's so terrible, it's actually enjoyable. And as I said at the start of this video, a big thing for me is the enjoyment factor. So I'm going to put Madam Web in the E tier because I actually didn't mind it. I actually had a decent time with it. And I feel like some people would say, oh, you should be ashamed to admit that. But at the end of the day, if I enjoy a film I'm not gonna deny it just because the consensus is that everyone else disliked it so yeah Madam Web it was not as bad as I was thought it was going to be so it's gonna be put in the E tier so thanks for watching guys I really do hope you enjoyed this video please remember to like comment and subscribe in order to receive great and maybe even improved quality content in the future and of course that is my tier list of the Spider-Man films um, it was actually very interesting I tried to do no planning for this video for the simple reason I wanted it to be authentic and genuine you know and and I'm actually pretty impressed with the tier ranking I've done I think it reflects my views on Spider-Man quite well but I want to hear what your guys' opinions are as well. Please feel free to comment your ranking down below. Uh, but let's just keep things civil, yeah? We're all allowed our opinions at the end of the day. So let's just keep it civil. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed my summer special. And I will see you in another one. See ya!